So, ladies and gentlemen, I've got Ros Watkins with me, who is the author of the acclaimed DI Meg Dalton crime series, which is set in the Peak District. The first series, The Devil's Dice, was shortlisted for the Crime Writers Association debut Dagger Award, which is so flipping fantastic. I felt so proud for you. Um, and was the Times, listen to this folks, the Times Crime Book of the Month. Again, really, really cool. Roz originally studied engineering at Cambridge and then worked as a patent attorney for 15 years which may explain why there's a dead one in a first novel. Uh, she also, she's also a qualified hypnotherapist and an animal trainer, giving plenty of scope for planning creative murders. Ros lives in the Peak District with a partner and a menagerie of demanding animals and likes walking in the hills with a dog, scouting out good places to kill people. So, uh, <laughs> Welcome, welcome. And and um, is your boy just sat at your feet right now? Is he still he there? Yeah, so he may start being a demanding animal any minute, but it looks like <laughs> far at the moment. It's when we get near to his, his time when he has his F-O-O-D. <laughs> I love it. I love the way we spell with our animals and the hope that they... <laughs> and they actually learn to spell, don't they, eventually? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you so much for coming on. I was honoured that Roz um, was actually endorsed my book, In a Brilliant Self to Shine, 10 Antidotes to Imposter Syndrome, Workaholism and Stress. I have to keep looking at that title because I keep getting the words mixed up, um, which isn't great, is it? But it's going to be published on the 25th of March, 2022. And I thought it would be really good to interview the people that actually endorse the book so and to get a different slant on some in exec insider secrets relating to that book so hence why I've invited Ros along. I've also got a slight confession to make folks Ros and I are friends we we trained together didn't we how many years ago? Lots is it? Uh, 18 yeah, not, oh my God, is it? Yeah, 18, mate. Well, I've been running B 16 years, and it took, you know, it took me a couple of years to get my backside into gear before I even set my business up. So, probably longer than that. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Look at us now, middle aged women. <laughs> Oh, no, thank you so much for coming on. I, I think this will be brilliant, folks, because typically we have people who come on the show that are still in industry or in the corporate world, but Roz has done both and is obviously an amazing author with Harper Collins, no less. Um, so... To get so people can get to know you, we're going to do a bit of a quick fire round. Okay. So the first question is, how long have you been in your current role? Um, well, if we count my current role as writing, um, yeah. basically about five years. Um, yeah, five six years. That's gone so quick, hasn't it? I I when, I, when you ask me, I'm thinking, no, it can't be, it can't be, but it is. Yeah. So um, describe a snapshot of an ordinary day for you as an author. What would you be doing? Um, so there is a lot of what you'd expect. So I've, I've got my little writing shed here in my garden, which is lovely. So I'm sort of looking out at, at a field which has got sheep in it and um, thinking about my book. Um, and sometimes I'm having days where I'm writing quite a lot of words and other times I'm literally just thinking, trying to work out plots. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of that. Some days it's really frustrating because you don't actually get any words down or you even go backwards. Um, but other days, you know, you get lots done. And then there's a, well, until the last sort of couple of years, there was quite a lot of going to um, sort of events and, you know, author festivals and doing panels and things. But 
obviously not recently. I've kind of been locked in my writing shed for the last 18 months. Because we're in COVID times. Trying not to yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you. I um, Obviously, I've been working at home as well. And I think it's really pushed me to stay at home. Um, I've, and, and, you know, some days my car doesn't go off the drive due to me and I'm just at home so um. much. Yeah, quite yeah. comfortable. But so behind us, we can see you've got a whiteboard. I'm dying to know about your ideas. And so you see, murder board. <laughs> is that your murder board? It is. It's actually got a, a massive whiteboard sort of all along the side of, of this garden room. Um, yeah. Sometimes it'll be full of post it notes for sort of plotting out ideas. Um, at the moment, it's actually it's just got a little drawing. So my next book um, that's out hopefully next year, it's called The Red House and I can actually see the little red house. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was just working out the, the sort of geography of the village um, where the next book was set. But it's not normally drawings, it's normally more like writing of sort of names and what they're doing and what their kind of backstory is and motivation secrets all that sort of thing oh, it helps so to pace up and down the room and and sort of write all that stuff on the board and and did you say you use post-it notes as well yeah sometimes pick. when I'm plotting the book I'll put different scenes because the book's maybe got like 80 or 90 scenes um yeah. sort of separate individual scenes not chapters um but they tend to move around a lot when you when you, especially when you're planning which I, I sort of plan the whole way through I don't just plan it at the beginning and then write it I kind yeah. of write a bit plan a bit so you'll end up with I might have a certain color of post-it note um for the different locations that my character's in so if my cop is in the police station she might be, I might put the scene on a yellow post-it or something like that and if she's out you know in the wilds I might put it on the pink one and then I can see as it's all laid out I can kind of see that there's a variety of different locations oh, um, which wow. going to. and then I can move stuff around sort of as as the book changes which yeah. always does when I'm writing it I love that you know because you know when I think one of my pet peeves is when I watch a movie and it's all set in the same location I hate that kind of thing. yeah you know the sci-fi movies where they're just in a space capsule I find it really boring <laughs> yeah yeah go go and like <laughs> land on a planet or something <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's an aliens <laughs> I love it and I was listening to oh I can't remember who it was I was listening to someone on the radio the other day very famous writer I can't remember who it was um, but they were saying that sometimes when they're writing, they don't know where the character's going to go or what's going to pop out. Mm. As you is, is it like that then? Definitely. I mean, I know some people do plot quite a detailed sort of outline in advance, but um, I tend to have a rough idea sort of how it starts, how it finishes, maybe. Um, but I find that I don't really know my characters very well when I start writing um, and they sort of develop and sometimes you write you're writing and you've just almost just sort of comes out of your fingers dialogue especially for me tends to come fairly naturally um, mm -hmm. and somebody will just say something that I'm not expecting and that'll lead them off in a completely different direction um, or you'll get later on in the book and you'll realize that something happened earlier that that actually sort of fits in really well but you didn't consciously know when you put that thing in where you were going but maybe on some level you did it's it's quite odd it's like flipping between that sort of conscious planning part of your brain and that unconscious letting it flow part of your brain yeah um, which is quite yeah quite an interesting sort of balance really between those two yeah I love it this is so hilarious, right? We're 10 minutes in already, and this was supposed to be the quick fire round bit. <laughs> I knew I'd be like this with you. <laughs> I just find it very interesting. Right? <laughs> so, so we next... can talk for England. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time we ever met, we were like, <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
<laughs> so my next question mm. is going to be, what's on your bedside table? Come on, oh, who do you, you what do you What do you think? A massive <laughs> pile of books, obviously. <laughs> and usually a cat as well, um, trying to steal possibly a coffee mug, which the cat is trying to steal. One of our cats <laughs> really loves coffee. So knocking the pile of books over, that's the general scenario. <laughs> And just one last quick fire question. Do you have a morning ritual or a routine? What's? I'm usually woken up um, by cats. <laughs> <laughs> what time do you get up? Off, sort of six ish, usually. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily mean to get up at six, but I, I don't let them into the bedroom because they start, they, they bring dead things in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes we had a rabbit the other day it's not good oh. um, and lots of rats so yeah um but about six they normally start saying that it's time for breakfast um, and yeah. I try and hold off for a bit but yeah I generally give in um and the, the dogs usually wake I think the cats wake the dog up basically so <laughs> And do you, what time do you start writing? Do you have a particular time that you start writing or? I don't really know. So no. I think when I was first sort of self-employed, um, I tended to feel that I had to be kind of working between set hours. Yeah. Um, otherwise I'd feel really guilty. Yeah. Um, but now I sort of feel a bit more relaxed and flexible about that yeah so it will depend so most mornings I'll take the dog for a walk um and then while I'm walking I'm usually quite often either listening to audiobooks or thinking about the book that I'm plotting yeah so the dog walk is sort of work. of work in a way yeah and I do sometimes like really make myself think about a particular plot issue um while I'm walking or, or doing something in the garden or you know something kind of fairly repetitive and yeah. that can work really better than just sort of sitting at my desk trying to thrash it out um but that's I do a really efficient way of thinking as well though yeah. and that's a good tip isn't it regardless of whether you're a writer or if you're in the corporate world mm. you know to do an activity a repetitive activity like that to help you to think things through That's yeah there's loads of research hit. isn't there on what you know when you're walking you activate different parts of your brain and and you know it's a really good way to actually start thinking more creatively yeah so that's my excuse anyway for just going on long dog walks when I should be working no it's yeah no I love it I I do a similar thing actually and yeah. you know it's interesting you say you set yourself with the task of something to think about and mine's less glamorous to do it while I'm putting my makeup on and getting ready. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> but no, uh, no, I love that. So um, I think I might have explained that. So the questions are going to be centered around different chapters in the book and we're going to move on to chapter two which is all to do with captaining your ship. And you and I are very familiar with this concept, aren't we? As coaches or trained coaches that be in charge of your own destiny, raise awareness of what's happening now, then you can choose to do something different. So from your perspective, how do you know it's time to change? And change could be a limiting belief, it could be a behaviour, it could be an emotion. What are your kind of signals um so usually what what gets me now makes me realize i need to sort of get control of things is when i feel myself mm. losing focus and drifting on to things like social media yes. which i think is a massive trap at the moment and i can almost feel as if my brain has not but as you know become less good in the last few years from you sort of have to be on social media I think as an author it's kind of expected um and it's been really great like 
for developing relationships and sort of meeting authors, meeting, meet, well, meeting um, yeah. readers, you know, that, that's that been good, even though I do mainly post pictures of, of cats and currently a hedgehog. Um, <laughs> no, it's really nice, and especially yeah. during lockdown, you, yeah. you know, sort of trapped in your own home. But I think the downside is it, it's, for me, it's made it a lot harder to do that, that sort of serious concentration that writing requires. So when I was writing the first book, um, I didn't really have this. I was on Facebook, but it wasn't really a part, big part of my life at all. Um, and also when writing was a hobby, it was somehow easier <laughs> to focus, whereas now it's more of a job. Yes. It's much more difficult. So when I feel myself kind of going down that distractible sort of rabbit hole, checking emails, checking Twitter, checking Facebook, I know I need to sort of get control of myself, um, which I, I, I sometimes just have to make myself, you know, not do any of that stuff between certain hours of the day. Um, yeah. Or I just do my do my half hour. Sort nice. Of and literally just do do sprints. So sort of sprints of half an hour, I absolutely just only think about writing. Yeah. Um, Ross has just held, hold, for, for those of you listening, she's just held up, um, what are they called, an hourglass? Yeah, it's like an egg timer, but it's a egg. half hour one. Yeah. That's a bit like the Pomodoro technique, isn't it? Very much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly the Pomodoro technique. It's just that I, the, the, the tomato-y things tick. <laughs> oh and it's annoying <laughs> yeah so this is like a lovely glass kind of attractive big egg timer thing yeah um, that does half an hour and I, I do sprints of that and that yeah that really helps me no that's again that's another brilliant tip if you so do you use it for when you're on social media or when you're writing sorry when I'm writing so yeah. I'll, I'll basically do <laughs> A half hour solid sprint and then the other thing that I managed to do in the early days of my writing was knacker my knees through um, spending far too much time sitting down with my legs tucked under me which is how I like to sit yeah. um, and so now after my half hour I'll get up and wander around a bit and sort of I always think I should get up and do some yoga or something but yeah. that doesn't really happen I just at least get up and walk around and you know, do something to stop my legs sort of seizing up. Um, yeah. It's really easy when you're writing to be kind of hunched over your laptop or, you know, with your, with your legs <laughs> somewhere that's not Oops. not good. So, yeah, so that I do half hour sprints and then wander around a bit. And you can't do that, well, I can't do that many of those really solid, solid concentration sprints before you know I need a proper break um yeah but yeah that really helps no and again I think that's a great tip and my um book coach she she does headstands oh god <laughs> yeah. puts me yeah. to shame like yeah. I wander around yeah. the room a bit yeah and but there's also that uh they reckon if you don't take a break every 90 minutes you your body goes into fight or flight right so, yeah. you know so you are triggering stress by not mm -hmm. working so that's that's really good I like I like that tip so um moving on segueing in into chapter three which is understanding what causes you to think so often um when I'm working with clients when we think it's it's often a series of triggers so mm. I was working for example with a guy this morning and there'd been an instant at work and it wasn't just one thing that had triggered him it was three things mm. and that had caused him to um, have the reaction he had but then sink for a bit yeah. so um, and then what we do is then we I listen to the language and we track back and we go back to the childhood events because mm -hmm. all we're done. So these triggers, they're just related to childhood experiences and then we're having them away. So thinking about, I suppose, I guess, what causes you to sink um, and also stress and that type of thing, what um, either positive or negative childhood experiences have, have influenced 
your personality for the better. Or it could be in a limiting way, whatever you want to share. So the one, the one I thought of when I, I just read through these questions, the one that struck me that was a thing that sort of was positive in the long run was um, something that happened when I was five, when um, it was, I think it was my second day at a brand new school. And um, although it's, it probably seems really bizarre to younger people, but um, when I was five, <laughs> The sort of Jurassic period, it was normal to let a five-year-old walk home from school on her own. Yes. Um, yeah. Was it the same with yeah. you? Yeah. Four, um, four and a half for walk to school. Yeah. Well, this was, it was only because we'd moved house that it was, you know, that I was five and not four and a half at yeah. my old schools at my old house. So it was a new school. And so I'd been told, you know, this is the way you walk home. Um, but the new school, they they chucked us out of a different um, exit than the one yes. that I come in at. So although I knew the way home from the other place, I got really confused and I went wandering off and I knew I was supposed to go left then left. It wasn't very far. Um, yeah. But I ended up sort of on the main road um, and I got a bit scared, obviously, but but what I did was I walked up to um, a stranger and yeah. a woman, as it was, but I would have asked a man as well, um, and just said, oh, do you know where, and then said my address, yeah. where that is. And of course, she, she took me home. Um, and it was scary, but it, it, I thought it was a nice thing to happen because it sort of taught yeah. me that it's good to ask for help. Yes. Um, and to trust people and actually most strangers are probably not you know gonna take you off and murder you yeah um, and you know I got home and I was absolutely fine and I think I have sort of hung on to that um yeah I mean yeah I tend to I tend to think it's not a bad thing to ask for help and it's not a bad thing to assume that most people are decent yeah no I agree entirely and you know from a personal development perspective because mm -hmm. I've, I've only just listened to seven habits of highly effective people <laughs> it was I'm a bit of a bugger when it comes to here's a popular book and I'll go well I'm not reading it then yeah which is ridiculous um I've always been a bit like that don't follow a trend just create your own and um Anyway, so I got around to listening to it and he was talking about, you know, interdependence. And mm -hmm. so I've always felt proud that I was independent. But of course, we need to be interdependent as well, don't we, if we're going to really mm. flourish. And um, so I think it's brilliant that you learn that lesson so early on that you are prepared to ask for help. Because, again, you know, from a leadership perspective, those leaders that aren't able to ask for help it's when they think because yeah. they're too busy trying to do everything themselves and they're either being perfectionists or overly controlling they think only they can do the job the right mm. way so so no I think that's a brilliant example <laughs> cool so we're going to move on to chapter five which is all about navigating towards destination joy and the reason we navigate towards destination joy is that when we're experiencing imposter syndrome, which then can drive on, um, imposter syndrome can help our performance. Studies are showing that, but it's when we overdo it, you know, when we're on that track of always proving, always pushing, that it can then lead to stress and workaholism, wore the t-shirt. Um, so it's, so what we're aiming towards. So if that's how it's been, we're also, one of the antidotes is to identify actually, what do I want instead? What's my idea of destination joy? So thinking about the next three to five years, what, where, where are you heading? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's really interesting to think, you know, interesting question, because uh, I was thinking about this earlier. I was thinking there are things that I really want in my writing career, um, but that I've almost decided not to have them in my head as specific goals yeah. um, because so many of them are so much outside my control. Um, 
because I have in the past got quite hung up on wanting to achieve things. Um, and I'm at the point now where, you know, I would absolutely love it if one of my books was made into a TV series, for example. I mean, yeah. one of them was optioned, but it didn't come to anything. Um, or I'd love, you know, to be a massive bestseller or to sell in 30 different countries or all these things. But I've realised that to sort of set that as a goal is counterproductive for me because I really, really can't control it. Yeah. I can only write the best books that I possibly can. And then so much of that other stuff is not within my control. It's random, you know, when it when it comes out, whether it hits the right moment or not, um, how much of a push it gets, all sorts of, you know, ITV didn't, didn't do the series partly because they just bought one that was too similar, you know, things like that you really can't control. And you yeah. can get yourself so hung up on that. Um, so those sort of things I tend not to have as goals and I tend not to kind of think about them too much really um, yeah. but then there is other stuff that I can control like I've just mentioned before that sort of considering a move to Cornwall and um, yeah you know that's something I can control and I can sort of visualize the you know kind of house and by near the sea walking on the coast path that sort of thing um, and that works for me because it's something that I feel like I can make happen. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've kind of also things like, you know, reviews and what people think about your book. You know, I, I used to get really upset by one star reviews at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I'd read them, which is not a good idea. And now I've realized that it, it's virtually impossible not to get upset if you get a really awful review in a newspaper or something because it's just it's a horrible thing to happen but that's never happened to me I've only had horrible reviews from people on Amazon and yeah. I don't know what's going on in their life so why get upset about it why allow them that power um and I did use at the yes. very beginning I used to get upset by that but I don't anymore so that's another thing that's not I can't control that you can't ever can't ever write a book that gets no one star reviews unless it gets very few reviews um yeah so yeah so they're those two different sort of types of thing that I have different types of goals for I suppose yeah. if that makes sense but again you've just given a really good tip I knew you'd be full of nuggets of genius <laughs> and and it's all to do with locus of control isn't it you know mm. we can stress ourselves out by wishing for things that we can't control mm. um, and whereas if we focus on just as you've said stuff that is within our power and control yeah you know. and the, you know the whole sort of you know there is there's this thing that if you sort of visualize something you want enough it will happen well it, obviously you without doing all the other things that, you, that you've talked about in your book it it, it probably won't <laughs> you know, I know the research suggests that that if you visualize that you you know you have this wonderful life and part of your brain shuts down and says we've already got it there's no point in doing anything yeah. so um yeah. this, the, the whole kind of like stuff will manifest for you I haven't found that to work and I know it, it doesn't work um yeah. so you know I, I do it's not that I give up on being you know a sort of a bestseller or whatever in that I still try and set myself kind of targets of things I can achieve like working a certain number of hours a day or whatever um but I do try to let go of that kind of end result goal yeah that I, that I can't control and I can visualize that as much as I want but it's really not going to make very much difference <laughs> to whether it happens or not unfortunately no, you're absolutely right. And I include some research in my book about that. They they measured a drop in, I can never say it, systolic um, pressure. So, mm. so what you're saying is backed by science that, mm. you know, visualising the outcome all the time, you've got to visualise the steps. Yeah, yeah. Leading towards. Get off your arse and do it. Yeah, do something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> I was listening to, uh, uh, what's he called, Frankie Dittori. Oh, yeah. Uh, today on Virgin, and he's released a book. 
Wow. And I hadn't realised he'd suffered um, quite deep trauma because his plane had crashed and he nearly died a couple of times. Oh. Um, and and I was thinking, oh, I know a technique that works very well with trauma yeah. and, and gets rid of it. And, and I do have in my mind that I would like to help a famous person one day. Mm -hmm. And so this might be, uh, might contradict what we've just been talking about. I also have the belief you have to be in it to win it, don't yeah. you? So you have yeah. to take actions. So I left a really random message for him today on, <laughs> on Instagram. Oh, and, I and I just thought, well, whatever, you know, yeah. you can ignore it or you can take me up on my offer. But, yeah. you know, unless we try and we take those steps, just as you've been saying, towards mm. the thing that we want, how are we going to ever achieve that? Yeah, you didn't just visualise you interviewing him, did no. you? You actually did something about it. Yeah, so, well, it was yeah. literally a 30-second mess. Do you just mean, oh. But you but anyway, know, do you? No, no. But, I, I, but again, letting go of the outcome. I just think, yeah. whatever, what will be, will be. Yeah, you can't control that, definitely. No, exactly. <laughs> anyway, <Cool>. so... <laughs> So I'm going to move on to uh, chapter nine, which is about learning to handle rough seas. So rough seas are our emotions. And I, it was an interesting, again, had a gentleman uh, this morning and he said, oh, I saw the tissue box and I was worried I was going to cry. Mm. And, and I said, look, hey, I have seen many grown men cry and you know it is it's kind of a commodity for me that sometimes when we touch on past stuff that's still influencing present day mm. um that it can provoke tears but you know I am completely used to it and it's you know it's as I say it's a commodity mm. and um <clears throat> I was sharing with you earlier that my dad died it was a week ago today actually and oh. one of the ways in which we my sister and I processed our emotions so we didn't use any fancy techniques didn't use Havening, and EFT didn't journal but the way that we handled our rough seas so our rough seas were our emotions and I think the difficult thing you know with cancer is you watch you almost do your grieving in front of the person well not physically in front of the person that's what we were trying to avoid is to be upset in front of dad we wanted to handle those rough seas so that we could be strong for him mm -hmm. and the way that we handled the rough seas we literally walked up and down Morecambe prom and we used to say We'd, it was like passing a baton we'd take it in turns to cry some days I was strong sometimes my sister was strong and we would empty our we called it empty I need to empty my tear buckets you know and we we would release that stuff and then we could be strong for dad yeah and um, so that was that's an example of how um you know I've learned to handle rough seas during grief so how do you manage your state of mind and how do you handle your because life does throw us waves, doesn't it, now and then? Yeah, I mean, I do, I agree really with the whole thing about letting yourself feel it. Because, you know, there's there's some sort of ideas about, oh, you know, almost like you've got to be positive the whole time, think positively, be cheerful or whatever. And, I, you know, that I don't think that's sense a bit like trying not to think of that white bear isn't it you know the more <laughs> you tell yourself to be cheerful you're then monitoring yourself am I cheerful am I cheer and you actually end up being less you know less happy than if you allow yourself to be genuine in your emotions so I think for something genuinely awful like you I just let myself feel it let myself feel awful yeah. Um, but for things where I think a change of attitude, you know, like something like your dad dying is genuinely terrible, but something like getting a one star review <laughs> is not. Yeah. So for things like that, I do try and kind of reframe stuff and change, you know, change my attitude to things. Or, you know, if I'm having a day where I think I can't write another book, um, I will try and talk to myself and tell my, you know, tell myself I've written four and I can write a fifth. <laughs> and that yeah. kind of, just, you know, 
basic stuff. Um, other times I'll do some, you know, if I'm just feeling really down about things. I mean, the state of the world at the moment, it's easy to focus on terrible stuff, isn't it? Um, yeah. You can get sucked into it. There's so much if you want to focus on bad things, um, which I do like myself sometimes. And I you yeah. know, also do think sometimes you have to get yourself angry so that you can do stuff. You know, I'm not averse to going on a march and writing to MPs and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, but you know, if I need to just get rid of all that and get on with some work, then I will sort of try and just talk myself out of it and maybe again, like go for a walk or something or do some exercise or dance around the kitchen, play with the dogs or the cats and, you know, just make myself <laughs> cheer up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. So there's a real, <clears throat> well, there's a few things there. One, have you come across the term toxic positivity that was bandied around on social media quite a bit right I, I I don't know if I have but I know exactly what that would mean yes yeah, <laughs> yeah. I call I call it a bit like Rod, Rod do you remember the characters Rod Jane and Freddie oh everything is okay and really it's not just frying themselves to sleep every night don't you? <laughs> so so that so that's really on healthy is to just pretend like everything's okay because then it can bite you on the bum in you know the the most unexpected way or we can explode or implode whichever way or you know again um just listening to a client the other day talking about how he was aware of someone was triggered emotionally and then all of a sudden they started having heart problems you know what I mean yeah. so mind influencing body mm. um but also when I listen to you there's a strong theme of doing something so mm. you know dancing or you know allowing yourself to feel which I'll be honest that's a new concept for me over the last I would say five years or so mm. and I mm. think I probably used to do the poxic the poxic the toxic <laughs> the toxic positivity thing Mm. Oh, everything's okay um <clears throat> when in reality and I think what it brought you know it was brought home when I watched that daft movie you know about emotions um oh, I haven't seen it but I know I know the one you mean yeah. where the little girl has got all the different emotions in her head mm. and you think yeah joy has competition yeah what do you mean we can't be that all the time can we because mm. there's competition for our emotions and and I think it helps us experience the light and shade of life, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't be happy all the time. It's just not yeah. possible. Mm. Yeah, but it's cool also that um, <clears throat> listening to your focus of attention is important, isn't it? Where we choose, so you know, consciously choosing to actually, I am going to look at the news and I am going to get angry about it because that will provoke action or. Yeah actually I'm going to choose to not look at I, I didn't look at the news during Covid very much because I didn't want to fill my head with nonsense it wasn't nonsense but too much negativity yeah. Um, yeah. there wasn't much we could do about any of it there really was there I mean and clicking like on someone's Facebook post is not action so it's like there was no there wasn't much point in a way in getting sucked down into it so yeah, yeah it's similar I tried it was hard at the beginning, wasn't it? I mean, it was yeah. impossible not to, to sort of follow what was going on and, and be distracted by it. But once it's been going on a while, I think you have to... I was glad I had a book deadline, actually. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, it sort of forced me to just get on with life, even if it did feel like everything was falling apart around me. I was like, well, I've just got to write this book, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so we're going to bring things to a close. Uh, another quick round, although our quick fire rounds aren't turning into quick fire rounds, are they? So <laughs> uh, what's the worst piece of advice you've heard being given? Um, I think it's this kind of jump and the parachute will appear type advice. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, we, we both obviously did the coaching and NLP and most of that is really sensible but there does seem to be this like lunatic fringe um, 
of that. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, no, sorry, jump for the parachute won't necessarily appear yeah. unless you put a parachute on your back <laughs> and learn how to use it. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's like, I suppose it's tied up with that whole visualization sort of the secret and that kind of thing that, you know, if you imagine millions of pounds they will suddenly manifest themselves and all that sort of thing I think yeah it's great to you know to to work hard for what you want in life etc etc but to think that if you just kind of do mad things you'll be okay doesn't (laughs) it I love it (laughs) so um when you think about success who springs to mind well the person that springs to mind I know she's a slightly controversial figure at the moment unfortunately but the person that springs to mind to me is JK Rowling because I I love that whole um you know moving from a sort of awful situation with domestic violence and poverty etc writing the book in in the cafe and yeah um, to mega success (laughs) it's um it's a nice story I haven't actually read the Harry Potter books at all um, yeah. I don't know a huge amount about her but that was kind of what's what sprung to mind yeah nice I like it so it to to bring things to a conclusion what would you say is your biggest insider secret that you would like to share with people or nuggets of advice or favorite phrase or saying <clears throat> um <laughs> I think we've covered most of it, really. I mean, it's funny when you said my favourite saying saying came into my mind, which is completely irrelevant, which is never try to out stubborn a cat. And I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> it's just like, just popped into my head. That's your favourite saying. Um, possibly it is. But yeah. yeah, I think I think we've kind of covered most of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's been loads of nuggets as, as we've gone along, so that's cool. And is there anything else you want listeners to know about? So your book titles, for example, or how can people connect, find out more about you? What would you like to share? Um, so I'm uh, Twitter is a good place to find me, especially if you do like pictures of animals. Um, and I'm at Ros Watkins. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and my first book that Estelle mentioned at the beginning, The Devil's Dice, that's the first in a series. Um, so uh, there's a paperback of that here, actually, I can show as well. Oh, ah, yeah. lovely. So, yeah, I'd love you to, to buy my books, obviously. Not yet, <laughs> box. And you, but, and you... Yeah, and do connect on Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's usually the best place to find me there when I shouldn't be, when I should be working. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) And you say you're up to book number five. So you've got book number four coming out hopefully next year, did you say? Yeah, that's nearly finished. We've had two rounds of edits um, and we're just sort of hopefully near to finalising that. Um, Yeah. And I'm just sort of... My, my um, main editor's been off on maternity leave and she's just come back. So she's reading that at the moment and also yeah. reading a, a pitch for book five. Um, yeah. So at the moment, nice. just waiting to hear back from her on both of those. And then it's full steam ahead with book five, hopefully. Yay. It sounds a bit scary. Yeah, <laughs> it is five books. That's amazing. amazing. Well, you know, I've since I met you I just I can talk to hours for you so interesting you've got such an amazing mind and just really on a pedestal for me I'm so impressed with everything that you've done no seriously genuinely you it seems like whatever you do you turn your hand to you you do a brilliant job of and I'll always be really grateful for you kicking me up the rear and saying, get yourself a proper publishing deal. (laughs) So um, I really appreciate it. And thank you for endorsing the book. I loved it. It was great. Well, thank you.